Hello, and welcome everybody to the National Trends in Disability Employment, or NTIDE, Lunch and Learn series. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar is being recorded. We will post an archive of each webinar each month on our website at www.researchondisability.org slash NTIDE. This site will also provide copies of the presentations, the speakers' bios, full transcripts, and other valuable resources. As an attendee of this webinar, you are a viewer. To ask questions of the speakers, click on the Q&A box on your webinar screen and type your questions into the box. Speakers will review these questions and provide answers during the last section of the webinar. Some questions may be answered directly in the Q&A box. If you have any questions following this recording, please contact us at disability.statistics at unh.edu or toll free at 866-538-9521 for more information. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy, Enjoy today's, today's webinar. webinar. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, as the case may be. Um, I'm John O'Neill, and I'm standing in for Andrew Houghtonville today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, this is the Entide Lunch and Learn. Uh, it's a, as you all know, it's a joint effort between the University of New Hampshire, the Kessler Foundation, and the Association of University Centers on Disability. It occurs at noon um, Eastern time on the first Friday um, day of each month, usually. <laughs> this month we're doing it on the 10th instead of the third. Um, and we will, and that's uh, the, the Friday that we release the Intide report. And this is part of the Rehabilitation Research uh, and Training Center on Employment Policy and Measurement, which is funded by NIDLER. Next slide, please. Uh, there are gonna be four parts to today's program as usual. First, I'll be reporting out on the Intide numbers. And then uh, we'll uh, hand it over to Denise Roselle, um, who will, um, uh, from AUCT, AUCD rather, and uh, who will provide us legislative updates and uh, she usually also provides uh, some real gems in terms of informational um, resources. Uh, part three today, we have a guest speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Callie Crane uh, for the Center on Transition and Career Innovation at the University of Maryland. Uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing her presentation. And um, at the very end, we'll take questions and uh, we'll do a Q&A and uh, then we'll be finished for the day. Uh, next slide. Um, next slide. The uh, NTIDE report uh, is a monthly report. Uh, it's a press release and an infographic looking at the latest employment statistics um, and it uses data from the jobs report, which as I've already mentioned, is released by the US Bureau of Labor Statistics on the first Friday, usually on the first Friday of each month. Next slide. Uh, the source of the NTIDE report uh, is the current population survey, which the BLS um, fields every month. It's the source of the official unemployment rate, which uh, so much is made about. Uh, it covers uh, civilians ages 16 to 64 not living in institutions, and uh, it can, we're, we're able to, um, uh, to um, look at this data on a monthly basis because the six disability questions were added in 2008 and have been available since then. Um, it's, uh, the data for people with disabilities is not yet seasonally adjusted and that's why we compare to the same month last year. Next slide. The numbers. Um, this month, um, the employment to population ratio improved a bit. 
uh, for people with disabilities, for both people with and without disabilities. It went from 30.4% uh, 30 last year, same month, to 30.6%, which is a 7% improvement. For people without disabilities, there was uh, an increase from 74.1% last year, same month, to 74.8%, which is a 9% increase. Next slide. Uh, we also looked at the labor force participation rate, and that for people with disabilities was flat. There was no change from last year. And um, by the way, the labor force participation rate includes those who are working, but also those who are looking for work. Um, for persons without disabilities, the labor force participation rate increased slightly from 76.9% to 77.3%, uh, up 0.5%. Uh, uh, next slide. Um, this graph represents um, uh, the employment to population ratio for people with and without disabilities. The uh, top line, the blue line, is people without disabilities, and the bottom line is people with disabilities. Um, and this information has been available since 2008, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, that was really the beginning of the Great Recession. And uh, as you can see from both these uh, lines, uh, uh, both these graphs that uh, people with and without disabilities were losing jobs um, um, basically uh, uh, at the beginning of the Great Recession. Uh, people without disabilities started to recover sooner uh, basically in about the beginning of 2013. They started uh, uh, returning to the workforce, people without disabilities, whereas people with disabilities really didn't start returning to the workforce until about the um, um, in any uh, assertive way until about uh, to the beginning of 2016, and we saw an increase, an uptick. Uh, over about a two-year period, uh, 2016 and 2017, for people with disabilities. Uh, since about the beginning of 2018, we've seen a leveling off. As a matter of fact, if we go to the next slide, you can see the trend lines. Uh, they've been snapped in, and you can see that for people without disabilities, since about as I said, events uh, about uh, the beginning of 2012-2013, uh, there's been a, a continuing, continuing uptick in the employment to population ratio. However, with people with disabilities, that, didn't, that uptick didn't really start until about uh, the beginning of 2016. It continued through 2000, the end of 2017, but it's le leveled off over the uh, last uh, uh, year and a half about. Next slide. Um, again, this is the trend line uh, presenting the, the same results um, as we just saw. Next slide. Okay, part two, I'm gonna hand this off to Denise. Um, and Oops. There I am. Hey everybody, this is Denise Roselle from the Association of University Centers on Disabilities. Um, why don't you flip to the next slide, Ferris. Um, let's start talking policy. Now, it's interesting, last month when we spoke, I told you that we had a continuing resolution for appropriations for, for fiscal year 2020. Those, that's the money from the federal government for their fiscal year that runs, that already started on October 1st, 2019, and runs to, through September 30th, 2020. Um, and I told you, I didn't think there was much, that we'd probably get another CR. We'd probably have that CR all the way through the year. I didn't think there was much chance we would have appropriations done this year. Well, 
prove me wrong. Um, the House and the Senate, my sound is fading out a bit. Okay, I'm pulling you closer to me and hoping that that's gonna be better. Um, it, 20, so we actually got appropriations. Um, surprise, surprise. So the, and I'm gonna turn it up a little bit too. Okay. Um, so that we've got an appropriations bill, the, the House passed it, the Senate signed it, the uh, Senate passed it, the President signed it. And basically, and again, that means we have appropriations, there is actually money from the federal government, we do not face any kind of federal government shutdown through the end of September. Um, most of the appropriations, most of the numbers, I'm not gonna run through numbers for you because most of it's flat funded um, or pretty close to flat, uh, Part B of IDEA, the special ed law got a little bump, but I mean really little. The assistive technology grant got a bump of a million dollars, which when you start, I think it's 30, 36 to 37 million, that's a little. Um, in regard to the grant, it's, it's somewhat significant, but in regard to what the federal government talks about as money, it's very little. Most of the programs were flat funded or pretty close, but it means there is money. It means um, you know RFPs will go forward. For those of you who are watching for RFPs in the spring, it means we're done. There's no more fighting about that and no more chance of it to shut down. Now, what's interesting is um, we're already starting on looking at appropriations for fiscal year 2021, which will run from October 1, 2020 through the end of September 2021. Um, me, and we're doing that because the, depart the administration has already basically done their appropriations numbers. Usually we see the president's budget sometime after the State of the Union in February. Um, State of the Union in January, we see the numbers sometime in February. I don't anticipate, of course, I was wrong, I don't anticipate that we're going to see any action on these appropriations for a while. It's an election year. There's a lot more going on in Washington right now. But know that we are starting to have those conversations in Washington right now about what happens so we can yet again avoid any kind of government shutdown come October. But that was big news. Um, the other thing that passed kind of as a part of that were some things around money follows the person. For those of you who have been tracking that, the HCBS spousal empowerment limit um, protections and any other healthcare extenders. Um, also that passed before the end of 2019. Unfortunately, we were trying to get um, extensions from money follows the person, for instance, that would be two to three years. Um, they kicked the can down the road again. The only extension we have now is through May. Same thing for the spousal, spousal empowerments, May 22nd. So we will be having another conversation about money follows the person, whether to do another short, um, to pass another short continuation come May, whether to do a couple of years, which is what we thought we were going to get, or whether we can get a permanent extension. Um, don't have any clue whether that will happen or not, but at least we have those things extended through May. Um, the other thing you need to know that's going on in federal policy right now, if you haven't seen it, really, you need to go look. Um, there is a proposed Social Security rule from the Social Security Administration, from this administration, that has some proposed changes that for a lot of people would mean they would have to reprove their disability every two years. So it will add a lot to disability reviews. It adds a lot of stress to people who have taken a long, well, I don't need to talk to this crowd about how hard it is to get on Social Security, how long it takes, what that means for employment, all of those other things. Um, there, the federal comment period is going on right now. Um, federal comments are due by January 31st. Uh, the link, the first thing, the Social Security rule link that's in these slides is to the rule, the suggested rule itself. The second one is how it is literally to the site where you submit comments. So if you click on the submit comments button and go in, you can get there. Go in and file comments. Um, th this would have a huge impact on a lot of people, including a lot of people with significant disabilities. Um, it's tied to the definition of how you are, uh, how your disability is defined. I mean, for some people, you are automatically, if you have a certain disability, you're automatically in, you're automatically in forever. For some people, there's um, medical requirement, there's a category, which of course I'm not thinking of right now, and I don't have it in my notes. Um, but they're figuring there are like 2 million people that this would affect. And a lot of those are people with disabilities and a lot of those are people with significant disabilities. So go in and look. The other place you can go look, um, AUCD, my organization, if you go to AUCD.org and search on um, social security rule, I think you'll pull it up. It gives some 
talking points, or if you go to the disability policy newsletter that we do, um, if you get that, it gives some talking points um, and sample comments that you can use. So it's a really important one out there right now. And then beyond that, what I told you last month is true. Everything, and actually it's even more true now, everything in Washington right now is being taken up by impeachment, um, Iran, Iraq, um, not much else is moving for a while. So, um, so that's kind of, that's the policy update for now. Okay, next slide. Um, let me talk for a minute about census. I'm raising this here and you, you're gonna hear it a lot within the disability community, I think within the next little while. So it's time for census 2020. Um, people with disabilities have been identified as a hard to count population, which means there's a greater extent of undercount and this census is incredibly important to people with disabilities. It allocates congressional districts. It allocates how federal money gets distributed. Things like IDEA are population-based. Title I, um, SNAP, which is food stamps, Medicaid, housing, the Section 811 programs, vocational rehabilitation, all of that stuff depends on state numbers and states get differing amounts based upon, and all of those numbers are based on the census. So, and the other thing is that people with disabilities, not only are we a hard to count population, but we are overrepresented in a lot of other hard to count populations, like people of color, people of low income, um, people experiencing homelessness. So this is a really big, this is an important one. And, um, and it is, we are hard to count on some level. That's part of it as well. So um, National Disability Rights Network has done a really nice job a lot, and you'll be hearing some others. I know the ARC is doing a real push around census, um, but National Disability Rights Network has been working with the Census Bureau and there's some great documents and materials. Next slide, Ferris. I gave you links to all of them. The, um, the Why the Census Matters for People with Disabilities, um, that one is by NDRN, so it's a disability specific lens. Um, a couple of the others are also disability specific lenses by NDRN. The, I think the Accessible 2020 FAQ is theirs as well. Some of the rest of them are by the Census Bureau, but I really encourage you to get out and talk to people about how important this is. Help people that you work with understand what a census is and why it's important and how to, how to be counted. Um, we need everybody to get out there and be counted. Um, next one, and you should start hearing about that soon from others, from the Bureau, for instance. Um, okay, so I have been in the disability world long enough in a variety of places um, associated with a variety of federal grant opportunities, RFPs, not just from RSA, from OSERS and OSERS, all across the board. And one of the things I have heard consistently over 30 years is, why don't we have more peer reviewers who understand what we're talking about? Why, and I know there are people that are really good peer reviewers, but I know we always need more. And RSA has put out a call. So I am saying to all of you, who have a knowledge in employment of people with disabilities, and I understand that some of you are going to be conflicted out and all of that kind of stuff if it's your grant or whatever, but seriously, folks, you have the knowledge. You need to be the ones re referring, uh, reviewing as, as peer reviewers for these kinds of grants. You'll look, they're looking for, R there are some RFPs coming out between April and September that they expect that they are looking for peer reviewers on. There's, and look at the list, it's unbelievable. Um, the demo projects, the rehab long-term training project, parent training projects, the Indian Vocational Services, um, the VR Technical Assistance Centers, that's the wind tax and all those guys, the Independent Living Services for Older Blind. Um, there's all kinds of them. Please, if you have questions, there's the link for questions, but the link to get um, more information is up at the top. And I really would encourage you, I, I can't say this enough, I hear enough people complaining about it when you don't get your grant, that people didn't understand what you were talking about. So now is the time. You understand it, please, 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 go out there. Um, send in some information. Okay, next one. RSA, this, um, this is also an interesting one for all of you. I say all the time, I'm not the research geek, I'm not the data geek, I'm the policy geek. But RSA has formed a new work group. It's made up of um, feds and state folks from states, state VR agencies, um, WinTAC is a part of it, the uh, Department of Education folks from the state and from the feds are part of this, and they're looking to um, talk about how do we use data to best tell the story of the success of the VR program and identify areas for continued evaluation. Um, 
they're looking to develop tools. It's all this, how do we take data and use it? And from, again, from the policy geek point of view, that's a big deal. We need to be doing more to understand and make that data usable by policymakers. But I also know we need to make that data usable by all kinds of other folks as well. So the first project they're looking at is the measurable skills gains data. Um, and they say in this announcement, there will be upcoming opportunities for stakeholder input. I don't know what those opportunities will be. I am putting it out there so people keep their eyes open because again, the people on this call have that knowledge, um, both on the data side and how do you interpret it. So I really urge you, there's a list. Um, oh, I didn't put the link in, I'm sorry. There is a list of the people who are members of the committee, um, the work group that's been formed. I think if you search on RSA work group, it's, um, it was in the NTACT newsletter. So if you search under NTACT, um, in their news, most recent newsletter, I believe, is where the announcement was. And it gives a list of the people who are involved and which states they're from, which VR agencies, et cetera. And um, I think if you look for that, it'll pop up. I apologize, I should have given you the link. Um, next slide, please. Let's see what I got. Um, for any of you I, from these particular states, there's a recent ODEP opportunity for, advan for um, additional TA on what they call their voice initiative. It has to do with, um, improving employment outcomes for within the statewide mental health system. And they're gonna get special help from ODEP and technical assistance, mentoring, all kinds of things to try to do some, some transformation within the states. These are the states that submitted and were chosen for it. A number of those states you can, and if you're from one of those states, I suggest you go find out who got the grant and how you can hook into it. Because again, you're the ones with the experts, the expertise. Um, if you search, again, if for individual states, I saw a bunch of um, press releases that the state agency put out to say, woohoo, we just got chosen for this voice grant by ODEP to do these things. So that'll hook you into who the agency is in your particular state who's looking at it. Um, but again, another, another nice one, and there's some, it's TA and um, techno sport, but if, if your state is doing this and making changes, you want to be involved. Okay, next one. Um, this is, this one I thought was awesome. I, this, it's a really nice, um, document. It's, it's titled, and it's out of a Nidler funded, um, transition, transitions ACR, um, disparities in vocational, re vocational supports for black young adults with mental health conditions. Um, it looked very specific. There's a lot of, there's a list about more research that's seated. There are a lot of resources and references listed. Um, I know the folks that I work with are forever looking for more um, information on culturally diverse populations. So this one is really nicely done. It's like four pages, five pages, I think. Um, and it looks at, and obviously, significant disparities in the delivery and the outcome of Vogue services. Yeah, well, yeah. And what are the research um, that's out there on barriers and facilitators to that employment um, for Black young adults with disabilities, and then how Vogue service agencies can can struggle to meet those needs. And then, like I said, there's a lot of references there, which I thought was really nice. So this is one that um, I was really excited to see this one. Um, and it's NIDLR funded, which is always, that goes a long ways for people to look at it. Um, next one, next slide, Sparrows. Um, okay, so this one is cool, and I need to pull out a separate piece of paper because I was gonna share some other things with you. So um, this is IMPACT. It's put out by the Institute on Community Integration um, and the RTC on community living at University of Minnesota, which happens to be one of our USED members. Um, that should be volume 32. Obviously, I have a typo there. Uh, and it is the whole issue is on um, self-determination and supported decision-making. And there are, uh, again, if we're talking about a variety of perspectives, I quoted two here. There's an article on self-determination, um, cultural differences in perception and practice. There's one on a global snapshot. Another, wow. Another typo of self-determination and people with disabilities. Um, but then some of the other ones, there's, there's an article about um, legal perspectives on self-determination in India. There's one there on uh, two decades of progress in Quebec. There's one around challenges on self-determination in Armenia. There's um, one on Australia um, and self-determination and individual choice. There are several that highlight states. There's one around Vermont's successful transition programs. There's one around um, Kansas, there's one, I thought there was another one that was a state-based one. Anyway, 
This entire thing is full of amazing articles. It is available um, in an interactive digital edition. It has bonus contact. It's also available in print. You can get it for free. Um, I was really, and there's, there's lots of stuff on supported decision making as well as around self-determination. And um, this was real, it is chock full of stuff that this community um, that's listening to this call, I think would be interested in. So I, and there's, there's also a bunch of personal stories from folks with disabilities telling their story about self-determination and, um, and or supported decision-making. Um, so that one was, I was thrilled to see this one come out and really want to share it. Um, next one, Ferris, I have another one around culturally, yeah, culturally and linguistically diverse populations. This one is targeted to students with learning disabilities, and it's particularly looking at um, Latino and Latina students. But um, the interesting thing, they're looking, flip to the next slide, this is the link for it, you can find that. The, what they found was that children of uh, parents of culturally linguistically diverse children with learning disabilities, they actually have very high educational expectations and philosophies for their children. Um, unfortunately, the students' transition plans don't reflect those expectations. And so how do you look to make some of those connections? Um, lots of, there's future research discussed, things that can be done in the future. There's this uh, discussion about the connection between high expectations and those who build capital through support groups. It's a really, um, again, a really well done piece that I thought was fascinating. And as I said, we all look for more information around culturally and linguistically diverse students um, with disabilities. And this was a particularly nice one. Okay, next slide. Let me see. I think they're almost, oh, DPS. Okay, let me put in a plug. Um, the Disability Policy Seminar is held every year in the spring. Usually it's in April, this year it's in March. It is an opportunity for, there's 700 people who come in to learn about policy in the disability world. It is primarily targeted toward people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but that is not always true. Uh, that anymore, that's just not, it's kind of disability wide. It is sponsored by a group of, including AUCD, my organization, but also the ARC, um, Autism Society of America, the DD Councils, AIDD, the National Down Syndrome Congress, um, SABE, um, United Cerebral Palsy. It's a big group of sponsors. And what we do is a lot of policy briefing and then days on the, a day on the Hill. Um, there is a specific track for people who don't, um, who don't know policy, kind of a 101 track that we started a couple of years ago. It's still going on. Um, so if you, if you don't want to get in the weeds, you don't have to. There's a lot of basic information about policy. And um, the flip of that is if you do want to get in the weeds, I guarantee you there will be lots of people who can get in the weeds with you about what's happening in Washington now, about um, what the issues are, about what might happen, about what your messages should be um, on the Hill when you go. So I got to put in a plug for DPS. It's a great, if you haven't been, it's a great, and you're a policy geek, or even just interested in learning more about disability policy, it's a great place to come. Uh, next one. Next slide. Yeah, and I thought, I was hoping you guys would put this one in. Oops, back one, Ferris. So the other thing is a plug, there you go, is a plug for the annual Disability Statistics Compendium, which is coming up on February 11th in DC. You can register for online, you can register for in-person. Um, I think probably all of us, the me, I know John, Andrew, the UNH folks, all of us will be there um, in person, but you can come online and um, and watch, watch the happenings. It's always a good, it's a good opportunity to learn what's going on in disability statistics. And even if you're not a statistics geek, which I'm not, there's a lot of good information and I love going. It's again, one of those opportunities to learn about the statistics and how do I connect them to other things. So I love that. Okay, now next slide. Thanks, Ferris. So I have the distinct pleasure of getting to introduce Dr. Kelly Crane from the Center for Transition and Career Innovation at the University of Maryland. Um, Kelly is the first of what we think is a three-part series around transition, January, February, March this year on the End Tide Lunch and Learn. So Kelly is the first speaker. Um, she is, I know Kelly because she is a co-PI on the Maryland Promise Grant that is just coming to an end that um, you all have heard about before. Ellie Hartman from um, Wisconsin Promise spoke on the End Tide 
maybe a year ago or so. Uh, she is also a co-director on Way to Work Maryland. Um, she has done all kinds of stuff with the Youth Transition Demo, um, Center on Transition to Employment. She's, um, basically her research is around transition and employment. Um, and, you know, post-school outcomes for transition age youth. And she is, going, she is our highlighted speaker today, and I'm thrilled to have her here, and I'm going to toss it to you, Kelly. Thank you, Denise. I'm, I hope everybody can hear me. I hope I, I clicked all the right buttons. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. I, I think I would add that I'm most proud of being a parent and a parent of a child who is just starting his transition. Um, as Denise said, my name is Kelly Crane. I am with the Center for Transition and Career Innovation at the University of Maryland. Um, next slide, please. Um, you can go to the next one. So our center at the university was launched two years ago in partnership with uh, the State Departments of Edu Maryland State Departments of Education, uh, the Maryland Department of Disabilities, and the Division of Rehabilitation Services. We are one of 16 centers in our College of Education at the university. And our funds come from federal and state grants and contracts, as well as university funds. And our center is co-directed by Drs. Ellen Fabian and Richard Luking, whom I'm sure many of you know, as they are pioneers in employment research for persons with disabilities. Next slide. So again, our center was uh, really developed in direct response from our state agencies to develop high quality research and evaluation um, to really look at the service planning and student outcomes for individuals with disabilities. The intent then is to use this information to build capacity and to generate policy recommendations for systems reform and improve outcomes for youth and students with disabilities in the state of Maryland, as well as across the country. Next slide. So our center activities really revolve around improving uh, the preparation and outcomes of youth based on their specific career goals. Um, as I mentioned, um, we are doing uh, research and evaluation and we will disseminate these rec research findings broadly. We're also looking to build collaborative uh, relationships and partnerships to implement innovative practices. And um, we have several capacity building uh, opportunities as well. So um, offering professional development to, to those in the field. Next slide. So what do we know? And John shared a little bit of this this morning, but over the last decade or so, we have seen the employment rates of persons with disabilities steadily but slowly going upward. Um, they're still not where they should or could be, but they are improving. Um, this is all good news. It means that our school to work transition outcomes are really catching up to legislative tent as reflected in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which mandates um, transition planning for students with disabilities, as well as the more recent Workforce Opportunities Investment Act, which Workforce Investment Opportunities Act, um, which looks at providing pre-employment transition services for youth with disabilities. So we're really chipping away at that problem. And that problem is um, these low employment rates for youth with disabilities, it's low, low rates in graduation. We don't see uh, youth with disabilities engaging um, in VR services at rates that we would hope. And also they're not accessing post-secondary education at the rates that we hope. Again, we are improving, but we're not there yet. So how are we addressing this problem? And, and we're really addressing it um, through implementing what we know works. And, and this has been through years of research that I'm sure many of you who are on this uh, phone call today have been doing. But what we know is paid work experiences 
prior to that high school exit is the most significant indicator of post-employment um, success for that, that youth. We also know that work should be part of the intervention, not just the outcome. So what do I mean by this? Um, instead of just talking about work, um, going out and watching somebody work, taking a tour, we actually need to get these young people out into the workplace in front of real employ employers doing real tasks for real pay. And, you know, Paul Wayman always says that, real work for real pay. And in doing so, we also need to uh, really define what that flow of services looks like for that youth um, and, and deliver that with some consistency um, uh, within our schools, across our states, and across the country. Next slide. So... I want to talk a little bit about how our center, the Center for Transition and Career in Innovation, is looking to promote work experiences, especially paid work, through some of our work. And I'm going to talk about uh, some of our research, as well as some uh, innovative practices that we are putting in place and some uh, professional development opportunities that we have underway. Next slide, please. So first of all, I want to talk about our Way to Work Maryland program. This is a uh, five-year random, uh, random design, random control design project. It was funded by the U.S. Department of Education, Rehabilitative Services Administration. The funding did go to our State uh, Division of Rehabilitation Services, or DOORS. Um, this project has a career-related intervention for students who are in high school. And so the intervention focuses on four key features, one of those being early engagement with VR services. The second is we um, are striving to give those youth three work-based learning experiences prior to school exit. We're also looking at paid and a paid employment experience. And then the fourth core feature is um, strategic coordination of service delivery across key agencies, which include the schools, the VR, and our state, our community rehabilitation provider. So work is central to this project. We really want to get youth to experience uh, work-based learning experiences or what we call in the state of Maryland, weebles. I'm not sure how many others call them weebles, but that's what we call them. Um, and we really have a high standard for these work experiences. Um, they're based on the, the youth skills and interests. They are community-based and they're integrated with other uh, employees who do not have disabilities. These experiences are at a minimum four weeks long and um, go anywhere up to, to eight weeks or, or more than that. So we really have um, a high standard for what we're, we're looking for in terms of our work experiences under this project. Um, the school serves, our school partner serves as the lead or the hub in coordinating these services to students who are part of our Way to Work project. And they collaborate very closely with our VR counselors and employment specialists uh, within our CRPs. In fact, uh, they meet at least monthly to discuss individual students and how they can coordinate those services to move students to work experiences. Um, so just real quick, um, we have 402 students uh, from eight different uh, local school districts and 71 high schools participating in our Way to Work project and 201 of those have been randomized into our intervention. Next slide please. So I want to share a little bit of data with you from our first 
uh, cohort of students. Um, and our first cohort just uh, finished up uh, this past summer. So the intervention went through this, this past June. We have 94 students in our first cohort who, are, who participated in Way to Work. And of those, 130, there were 137 work-based learning experiences. Now this is total work experiences. As I mentioned, uh, we strive to have youth have three work experiences. Um, so of those 94, there were 137 work experiences. 78% of those had at least one work-based experience. And then out of that 94, 49 students had two or more work-based learning experiences and um, 39 of those work experiences were paid directly by the employer. And we really, really strive to have that paid by the employer experience for our youth. And I'll talk more about that in a moment, but I wanted to highlight um, our graduation data from our first cohort because I think it looks pretty good. Um, so 93 of the 94 students did exit high school with either a diploma or certificate of completion. So that's, we were pretty excited about that data. Um, next slide, please. So through our research on this way to work project, we've really been able to demonstrate the value of work experiences prior to school exit. Um, and we're starting to see our state agencies really buy into um, putting more emphasis around planning for and facilitating these work experiences. Um, in fact, in the state of Maryland, we are meeting our requirements around pre-employment transition services. Um, so as I mentioned, at least one of these Weebles, these work experiences, um, we strive to be paid and paid by the employer. Um, we have seen an uptick in these numbers in our second cohort. Um, so we're seeing a lot more paid employment with th this group of students. And so I, I looked at combining some of the numbers and the stat is still coming in. Um, cohort two does go through the end of uh, June of this year. So they have six more, six more months of rece receiving the intervention services. So today uh, with the, the two, cohort of, two cohorts of students, 431, um, there have been 431 work experiences. Um, 129 have been paid by the employer. What I wanted to point out is, um, so again, we, we really work very hard to have these experiences paid by the employer. Um, during the second cohort, our agency has provided um, payment as well. So those numbers are not pulled out separately right now, but we're also seeing value in that by having the agency um, pay that youth and then that employer going on to hire that uh, young person. So those numbers we still have coming in. And I just wanted to point out um, the average hours per week are around 15. Again, these experiences are at a minimum four weeks in length. Um, and the hourly wage there you can see is 10, just over $10, which is uh, slightly above the minimum wage uh, in the state of Maryland for 2019, so as of last year. So uh, uh, this Way to Work project will continue to track these paid work experiences and the impact that they have both on graduation outcomes as well as employment at that point of ex exit. And we hope that our data shows what literature has been saying for years, um, and that is paid work and jobs while still in high school significantly increases the likelihood of adult employment. So next slide, please. 
Another project that I wanted to talk about is our Maryland Transition Tracker. Uh, this is a collaborative effort with our State Department of Education. This project too is, is um, allowing us to better plan for, facilitate, focus, coordinate services um, for work experiences. So what we've done is we've developed a um, software system where we can track and share data around transition services and outcomes among agencies. Um, currently that data is being shared between schools, our VR agency, and DDA, which is our Developmental Disabilities Administration. So this is just a really great opportunity again for um, individual school districts, um, individual IEP teams, uh, local interagency teams to go in, look at this data, get this information, and better coordinate um, the services that they're providing to move youth to work experiences. Um, we piloted the tracker last year in the state, and we are going to, we this month started to implement it across several uh, school districts in the state, and we will continue to stagger that implementation. Again, um, this is this is very innovative um, and exciting for the state of Maryland to have this opportunity to share data across these agencies. And again, with that sole purpose and really focusing on how to better plan for and facilitate work experiences for youth. Next slide, please. And then the final project I wanted to talk about is this interactive online training curriculum. This uh, project too was in direct response um, to our state agency of education as well as the Department of Disability. Um, as Denise mentioned, I was part of the Promise Project in the state of Maryland, which was a large scale multi-component transition intervention. So we were serving um, close to a thousand students across the state. And one of the things that we learned um, in that project is um, we really needed to build the, the capacity and the skills and knowledge of transition professionals on how to um, negotiate, plan for, facilitate, monitor these work experiences. So um, the state departments came to us and asked us um, to help prepare a training curriculum. And we did do this in partnership with our State Department of Education. And we are focused on um, disseminating this to um, our school professionals. But what it is, it's a, it's a eight session uh, skill building um, curriculum and it is self-paced so people can go in and take it at their own pace but what's particularly unique about this professional development um, curriculum is that we are also providing uh, coaching to anybody who participates so that they can um, ask questions where they might not understand something, but more importantly, allow us to help guide them in implementing um, the practices we know that work in moving uh, youth to better post-school employment outcomes. Next slide, please. So that brings me to the end. Um, again, highlighting some of the, the projects we have going on at the center that look at promoting work and paid work um, for young people with disabilities. You see I have a QR code on this slide. You can go visit our website for more information about each of these projects. Um, and I mentioned our, you know, I talked a little bit about our Way to Work project. On our website, we have several stories uh, about how uh, the experiences of these youth, but also employers and the buy-in that we've gotten from employers and providing paid work experiences. So next slide. 
Kelly, this is John. I, uh, we have several questions. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. It's really well or organized and uh, well presented. There's uh, one of our uh, participants has asked um, about um, the post-secondary uh, education transition uh, issues that you may be dealing with um, and the degree to which you, you support that. So moving, so the low rates of youth moving into post-secondary education, um, we, through our Way to Work project, we will be tracking uh, our, our data in terms of the youth who connect and go on to post-secondary education. I don't have that number for you right now, but that is part of our project um, to promote that um, to, to um, before kids exit, link them to training opportunities as well as educational opportunities to further build their career skills. Um, I had mentioned uh, the team of folks that work on our Way to Work project at the local school districts, um, including being led by our school personnel, our VR agency and CRPs, but many, many, many of those um, teams have somebody from um, higher education, community colleges sitting in those meetings to help inform and plan for that next step for these youth. So I think that, I think these teams that we have that do individual planning for youth are, are really unique and, and they're working well. Right. There was another question. Uh, they're still coming in. Um, how um, are business connections being made? So we are, you know, I talked a little bit about our professional development. Um, we are building capacity around that. We work with um, community rehab providers, so employment specialists at these CRPs. Um, their main responsibility is to make the connection with employers in the communities. Obviously, this is their job. This is what they were hired to do, their employment specialists. So the school personnel isn't necessarily, in some cases they do, but they're not the ones going out and negotiating those work experiences. Rather, they work in collaboration with employment specialists at our CRPs and as well as our VR counselors in no negotiating those placements. Um, as we learned a lot in our cohort one. In cohort two, uh, we have seen a lot of employers who are really embracing this idea in our different um, counties across the state. And we're seeing some employer to employer referral um, in this whole notion of, of work experiences really spreading out. But um, that employer piece really is a responsibility of our CRPs in the state and negotiating those placements. Okay, thank you. There's uh, also another question. Um, this one is uh, how has paid employment affected students that are receiving SSI or, or SSDI? <laughs> it's a great, that's a great question. Um, you know, that is something um, we look at for our way to work students. Not all of them are on SSI, but we do, we do have a significant number who are. And um, we connect them with that benefits counseling, benefits management, um, so that they're very informed about the decisions that they're making. Um, of course, Maryland uh, had the Promise project and implemented that. And, you know, it goes without saying, and I think we all know this, that um, paid employment, empl you're always making more money being employed than not being employed. And that's why that benefits counseling, benefits management is necessary when you have somebody who's on SSI so that you can make sure that there is a balance and you can move that person to paid employment, hopefully full-time or whatever kind of employment they might need. 
So we do build in that benefits counseling, benefits management as needed. Thank you. There was another question. Um, so far, this is the last one, I think. Uh, how are Maryland's uh, transition teachers and job coaches trained in your intervention to increase uh, work-based uh, learning uh, experiences? Good question. Um, so as I mentioned, we have eight um, local school systems participating in our Way to Work project. There's 71 high schools. Um, the DOORS, our Division of Rehab Services, um, partners with our center at the university. And we provide um, some capacity building to each of these local school districts participating um, in um, building their knowledge and skill set around um, job development and job placement. So we have provided them training, but we are meeting with them and connecting with them on a regular basis just to see how it's going. Um, I mentioned the, the, that Way to Work is a partnership. Um, the VR folks and the CR folks are doing a lot of that employer negotiations, those employer placements. So it doesn't all fall on the school personnel, but we are still building the skill set of those professionals. And I mentioned that curriculum that we developed. This really was out of um, a need that was coming from our State Department of Education saying, you know, we need to get our, our professionals um, more knowledgeable um, and ready to provide these kind of work experiences for youth. And we see legislation moving that way, we see practices moving that way. Um, and so that's why we are, are um, why we really developed this online curriculum direct response to build that skill set. Okay. There actually is one more question. Um, there's someone who is asking about um, who's at a Ohio <clears throat> at a school for the deaf in Ohio and uh, they're they're working with those uh, with deaf and hearing uh, hearing uh, hard of hearing students and uh, attempting to get them into the workplace would you have um, anything to say about this population you know um, through my uh, through Promise, we we worked with this population. We did have youth who um, had hearing impairments and who were deaf. Um, I don't have anything very specific that um, I can point to other than the fact that we made sure that our staff, when we were interacting with those students, um, that we were um, well prepared and, 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 and had the necessary accommodations and supports available to um, move them to work. So for example, um, you know, just having those interpreters go out with our employment staff so we could have that effective interaction with them as well as um, teachers who were working with them. Okay, well, thank you. Those are all the questions uh, from people, uh, from the participants. Um, I had a question regarding um, um, regarding the, the degree to which you believe uh, this effort is scalable to the uh, state of Maryland as a whole. Yeah, you know, with our, our Way to Work project, we are looking at scaling that up and sustaining what we're learning. Um, certainly when you, you get um, federal monies to do these kinds of things, it's a little easier, but our intent is um, to continue to, to sustain some of the activities that we're doing under our Way to Work project, um, such as um, having those individual teams meet to talk about 
students and plan these work experiences for students. Um, and that's one one thing that we know we can do, but we're also looking at expanding um, these practices to other um, local school systems in the state. So it's it's a hard one to answer, you know. It's but we we are sort of chipping away at it, and we're really um, now that we're coming to the end of our second cohort in June, we're looking at how we can sustain and and reach out to other school districts. And I think the, the two other things I talked about is our transition tracker um, is one mechanism that will help us do that because we'll be able to share data across various agencies um, as well as that online curriculum, just building the capacity across the state. Okay. Well, thank you. We're uh, actually, uh, it's one o'clock. So we typically end at this point. I want to thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, very informative. And uh, if people have other questions, they can continue to ask them. And um, our staff from the University of New Hampshire and uh, Kessler Foundation will, will attempt to get back to everyone. So thank you all. See you next month, I hope. Let's <laughs> go.